Hello. Welcome back to another edition of the Imagine Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Rundleman, from the New School's Manus School of Music. Today's episode is entitled, A New Orchestral Renaissance, an Analysis of 20th and 21st Century American Music. In the midst of a global pandemic, American orchestras face yet another invisible challenge, change. Throughout history, periods of musical innovation and change have often occurred following severe social, political, economic, and demographic shifts. While such adjustments are necessary, the steadily growing amount of change initiatives occurring in the United States is somewhat unprecedented. Within the field of American orchestral music, historical analysis suggests the occurrence of a new musical renaissance period in the 21st century. More specifically, the influenza pandemic, the Harlem Renaissance, and Roosevelt's federal music program provide interesting clarity into the sudden updraft of arts funding and orchestral change initiatives occurring today. What is a musical renaissance, and why might we be entering a new one? Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a renaissance as a movement or period of vigorous artistic and intellectual activity. Similarly, musical renaissance periods are typically characterized by sudden swells in musical innovation, experimentation, and composition. However, gaining grounded insight into the overall trajectory of American orchestral music first requires an in-depth understanding of the past. The term renaissance commonly yields direct association to 14th through 17th century Europe. Occurring directly after the Middle Ages, this period of reformation and rebirth is more formally referred to as the Renaissance. Affectionately nicknamed the Golden Age, and often lauded for its achievements in art, science, innovation, and literature, this glorified era indirectly disguises the less desirable characteristics of the time period. Around the end of the Middle Ages, European cities became more densely populated, with manufacturing jobs and urban employment drawing people to crowd inside tight city walls. While the increased inhabitation helped catalyze various social innovations, the crowded living conditions led to frequent disease outbreak. For example, malaria, typhoid, dysentery, deadly influenza, measles, and the classic pox, thus causing mortality rates to spike. However, the arrival of the bubonic plague also known as the Black Death, in 1348, completely devastated Europe. Unlike the recurring disease outbreaks, which would occur in waves, the Black Death, quote, did not go away, it remained endemic, end quote. While the Black Plague was not a direct cause for the Renaissance, it presented a heightened need for change that rippled through various facets of European society, including orchestral music. Ada Palmer, Associate Professor of Early Modern European History at the University of Chicago, posed the following question, quote, If the Black Death caused the Renaissance, will COVID also create a golden age? End quote. Due to history's cyclical nature, reviewing the past can often yield useful insights about the future, thus making a golden age certainly possible. Under this premise, the replication of multiple historical events between separate eras of time yield reasonable potential for additional events to recur in succession. Whereupon Palmer's claim would require extensive historical analysis, the large time period gap between 14th century Europe and 21st century America makes this claim somewhat challenging to conceptualize. Luckily, the Renaissance was not the only musical renaissance seen by human history. In fact, such periods have occurred more frequently than one might expect. Instead, utilizing a more recent renaissance creates a stronger comparison to the 21st century, especially within the specific lens of American orchestral music. Refocusing towards the 20th century, the influenza pandemic of 1918 through 1919, and the events in American history that directly follow are worth exploring. Much like the Black Death, this viral infection was beyond medical comprehension of the time, 
thus leaving society completely vulnerable to the full effects of the illness. While the origin of this mutant virus remains unknown, its initial appearance in Europe and North America during March and October of 1918 fueled various theories, citing the disease as a form of war propaganda. While many of these stories proved unlikely, the fact remains that, quote, no one had the slightest idea of the source of the infection or the vectors of its transmission, end quote. Sir George Newman, chief medical officer of the British Board of Education, described the disease as a, quote, thief in the night, end quote. Not only was it a fast-moving virus, but it carried a, quote, particular ferocity for young adults in the prime of their lives, end quote. Nicknamed the Spanish flu, the influenza pandemic infected millions of people, resulting in a death toll higher than World War I. Aside from quarantining and isolation, none of the measures enacted by the medical profession seemed to have any impact upon the severity of this pandemic. What began as a headache with chills and a, quote, burning sensation in the eyes, end quote, rapidly progressed into, quote, fever, dreams, and delirium, end quote. Quote, death came quickly, but not painlessly, as the victims of the Spanish flu suffocated on the fluids released by the infection, essentially drowning victims in their own body chemistry, end quote. In comparison, quote, COVID-19 was identified in Wuhan, China in December 2019, end quote, as, quote, a new virus in humans causing respiratory illness, end quote. Similar to the Spanish flu, COVID-19 was primarily combated via quarantine procedures. Medical officials discovered that the coronavirus, quote, primarily transmitted from person to person through respiratory droplets, end quote, when sneezing, coughing, or talking. Like influenza, COVID symptoms began with fever, chills, headaches, and difficulty breathing, but also included sore throat, diarrhea, loss of smell or taste, nausea or vomiting, etc. Although primarily categorized as mild, COVID's probability of severe reaction increased among older people and those, quote, with underlying medical conditions, end quote. While the CDC's Center for Disease Control and Prevention outline of COVID-19's symptoms, effects, and transmission seem fairly standard here in the 21st century, Palmer reminds us that, quote, this is the first time in the history of this planet that any species has faced a pandemic knowing what it is and how to take effective action, end quote. The ability of today's medical profession to identify a new virus, locate its origin, develop protective gear, and ultimately create a vaccine is new technology. Karen Nitkin of John Hopkins Medicine outlines that following the World Health Organization's declaration of COVID-19's pandemic status on March 11, 2020, the United States rapidly surpassed 100,000 coronavirus deaths on May 27, 2020, which later climbed to 500,000 by February 22, 2021. With this in mind, one can only imagine how much worse the COVID-19 pandemic could have been. Furthermore, the visible medical and social advancements found in the 21st century indicate that a Renaissance period or periods must have occurred sometime after the influenza pandemic of 1918 and prior to the coronavirus pandemic of 2019. Following the Spanish flu, America experienced a sudden influx of artistic expression and musical innovation during the 1920s and 30s. The Harlem Renaissance effectively marks one of the more prominent Renaissance periods of the last century. Occurring in the Manhattan borough of New York City, this particular movement resulted from shifting racial demographic climates in the United States. Carrie D. Wentz, a distinguished professor of history at Texas Southern University, highlights that the Harlem Renaissance marked the first time that African American arts received substantial attention within American society. Specializing in the Harlem Renaissance and African American political thought, Wentz's article entitled The Harlem Renaissance, what was it, and why does it matter, offered extensive context into what life in Harlem was like during the Renaissance period. 
The Harlem Renaissance goes by many names, including the New Negro Movement, the New Negro Renaissance, and the Negro Renaissance. However, considering Renaissance periods tend to be labeled retroactively, Harlem's significance, quote, serves more as an anchor for the movement than as its sole location, end quote. The complex history behind Harlem's development and the underlying racial tensions help contextualize various change initiatives occurring among American orchestras in the 21st century. In the 1920s, Harlem included the northern portion of Manhattan Island, above Central Park and east of 8th Avenue. Originally intended for wealthy white Americans, a sudden downdraft in Harlem's residential market left developers selling and renting to African Americans at drastically reduced rates. Much like the European Renaissance and Palmer's criticism regarding the inaccuracy of the term the Golden Age, Harlem's rapidly growing black population led to overcrowding and poor living conditions. Often overshadowed by the glamorous depictions of Harlem in black literature, for example by Langston Hughes, W.E.B. Du Bois, etc., most Harlem residents lived in poverty inside, quote, dilapidated housing, end quote and surrounded by racial discrimination. In 1935, the Harlem race riot exploited the, quote, general frustration with racial discrimination and poverty, end quote, brooding below the surface of the Harlem Renaissance. False rumors claiming that a young Puerto Rican boy had been beaten to death by police over a shoplifted pocket knife incited a massive riot in Harlem that resulted in six deaths 495 injuries, more than 500 arrests, and $5 million in local damages. While, quote, Mayor Fierro LaGuardia established an interracial committee to investigate the riot, end quote, this event strikes a certain resemblance to the repetitious instances of racial injustice and police brutality occurring throughout America today. Instances of racial discrimination came in many forms during the 20th century. Within the American orchestral field, discrimination commonly took the form of microaggressions and general systemic inequalities. This time period also saw an intense mixing of black and white musicians across all social levels, which led to the spread of Afro-American music into the American musical tradition. The term New Negro was a concept originated by early black Renaissance leaders. Through attending high-class events, for example, operas, ballets, symphony orchestra concerts, etc., and producing high art, they sought to elevate the status of blacks within American society, with a long-term goal of integration and equality. Shuffle Along, an all-black Broadway musical by Noble Sissel and U.B. Blake, kick-started the Harlem Renaissance by introducing white audiences to, quote, black music, theater, and entertainment, end quote, and sparking a, quote, the white fascination with Harlem and the African-American arts, end quote. This trend for black art extended into concert music, where black composers such as Robert Nathaniel Dett, William Grant Still, and Florence Price used black folk music, Negro spirituals, jazz, and the blues within their compositions. Additionally, Non-black orchestral composers such as Aaron Copeland, George Gershwin, Igor Stravinsky, and Virgil Thompson were also integrating black musical devices and practices into the orchestral canon. However, Floyd also cited that this rapid absorption of black culture was not always properly credited, which made such musical innovations, quote, less recognizable as black to the general public, end quote. Two prime examples of black musical inspiration that produce great success without proper recognition occur in George Gershwin's opera entitled Porgy and Bess and in his Tony Award-winning musical Crazy for You, originally entitled Girl Crazy. Arguably two of the most recognizable tunes from either production, Summertime, was actually based upon the Negro spiritual Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child while the melodic theme to I Got Rhythm was in fact a, quote, signature motive for William Grant Still and his improvisations and his compositions, end quote. 
This trending lack of racial representation and credit led to emerging racial tensions within classical music, which have crescendoed into fervent calls for improved racial equity and inclusion within today's orchestras. While the Harlem Renaissance served as the preeminent source of innovation to American orchestras during the late 1920s, early 1930s, a similar movement known as the Chicago Renaissance blossomed in 1935. Ray Brown, an African-American musicologist, referred to the Chicago Renaissance as a, quote, second flowering, end quote, that extended the, quote, continuum of black arts, end quote, past the Harlem Renaissance. Together, these two movements highlighted a, quote, much longer, end quote, presence upon American classical music and therefore gave black arts, quote, greater significance, end quote. Like William Grant Still in Harlem, Florence Price was integrating black musical styles and practices into her compositions in Chicago. Quote, the Great Depression hit black America especially hard and work was hard to come by, end quote. The struggles of the Great Depression created a shared commonality between blacks and whites, and like New York City, Chicago's segregated living and working spaces gradually gave way to artistic integration. Towards the end of the Harlem Renaissance, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal brought innovative federal support to American orchestras for the purpose of cultural development. While in the midst of the Great Depression, 1929 through 1939, the rising popularity of media had displaced, quote, 30,000 musicians with new mechanical modes of musical reproduction, end quote. In general, technological advancements and improvements to social efficiency tend to eliminate jobs and practices that are no longer deemed effective or essential. The process of recategorizing essential versus non-essential positions or practices is a key feature to any Renaissance period and serves as a natural catalyst towards innovation and change. Within Roosevelt's Second New Deal of 1935 emerged the Works Progress Administration, also known as the WPA, and the Federal Project No. 1, which included five distinct artistic branches tasked to, quote, alleviate unemployment caused by the economic depression, end quote. These five branches included the Federal Art Project, the Federal Music Project, the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Writers Project, and the Historical Records Survey. Focusing specifically on the Federal Music Project, or FMP, live musical experiences were brought to Americans all across the country. Led by national director and former conductor of the Cleveland Symphony, Nikolai Sokolov, the FMP employed nearly 16,000 musicians across the country and presented an, quote, estimated 5,000 performances before some 3 million people each week, end quote. Ensembles included symphony orchestras, chamber ensembles, string quartets, choirs, operas, military bands, dance orchestras, theater orchestras, etc. Additionally, this project utilized high musical standards to foster public appreciation for music. As a classically trained musician, Sokolov favored high art, which is traditional classical works from the Western canon, and, quote, encouraged American composers to create their own symphonic scores, end quote. Although Sokolov carried a personal disdain towards the inclusion of jazz and swing as popular music, he often set aside his own preferences, quote, so as to not disenfranchise the participation of ethnic minorities, end quote and further stated that the, quote, WPA music projects were for all sexes, creeds, races, and colors, end quote. Sokolov's stance on inclusion and equality was somewhat innovative within the orchestral field during the mid-1900s, especially considering America's rising instability around segregation and women's rights. Mirroring Sokolov's push for nationalist compositions, quote, Roosevelt envisioned the music projects as instruments of regional and community expression and cohesion, end quote. This created opportunities for American folk music to be recorded authentically with proper credit. Following Sokoloff's tenure as FMP director, Charles Seeger helped to expand and strengthen Roosevelt's initiative. 
Seeger's founding and, quote, development of the study of ethnomusicology, end quote, sought to broaden traditional viewpoints by collecting and presenting a more inclusive array of music from varying cultures and social backgrounds. Together, Sokoloff and Seeger's respective values towards the FMP, its participants and overall use, provided an initial framework for orchestral diversity, equity, and inclusion. Nida Ulibi, a reporter for National Public Radio, or NPR, highlighted that during a period where most Americans felt they had little in common, the WPA highlighted the vitality of a shared cultural identity through the arts. Quote, by 1941, WPA musicians had performed 7,300 separate original compositions of 2,558 American composers, end quote. While the FMP no longer exists, today's National Endowment for the Arts stands upon the shoulders of what came before. Similar to how the rings within a tree trunk present a comprehensive history of that tree's life, viewing the history of arts funding in America illuminates patterns that explain when Renaissance periods are likely to blossom. Mirroring the $4.8 billion Emergency Release Appropriation Act of 1935, which resulted in the creation of the WPA, the United States Senate issued a $2 trillion CARES Act, or Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, on March 25, 2020. While this action didn't result in the formation of a new federal arts program, it provided the existing National Endowment for the Arts with $75 million in grant funding for the purpose of continued cultural and institutional learning. For historical context, the National Endowment for the Arts, or NEA, was established by the United States Congress in 1965 as a federally funded independent agency. Positioned as the nation's premier federal arts initiative, the NEA, quote, supports arts learning, affirms and celebrates America's rich and diverse cultural heritage, and extends its work to promote equal access to the arts in every community across America, end quote. This sudden updraft of NEA funding is very interesting, considering the government's steady decline of funds towards the arts throughout the past few decades. Why? Historically, culture and the arts often function as, quote, forms of political competition, end quote, with the purpose of displaying a society's wealth and power. In regard to societal tree rings, both American and abroad, quote, increasing wealth, end quote, for example, funding, and, quote, increasing instability, end quote, serve as a, quote, recipe for increasing art and innovation, end quote. Understanding this direct correlation between the arts and politics explains why museums and libraries are often organized by historical events or periods. Palmer cites that, quote, when times get desperate, those in power pour money into art, architecture, grandeur, even science, because such things can provide legitimacy and thus aid stability, end quote. These influxes of arts production, which later become historical relics, are representative of, quote, lived experiences, end quote. Quote, not because people were at peace and had the leisure to do art, but because they were desperate after three consecutive civil wars and hoped that they could avoid a fourth one by shoring up the regime with a display of cultural grandeur, end quote. Therefore, sudden updrafts and arts funding during times of social instability serve as notifying signals of impending musical renaissance periods. Paired with funding trends, rising change initiatives help to actuate points of social instability into the driving forces that eventually result in the birth of a Renaissance era. During the Harlem Renaissance, this concept of change initiative was represented by the New Negro concept, which pushed for racial equality and inclusion. Extending from these initial change initiatives of the 20th century, the National Endowment for the Arts defines itself as an independent federal agency focused towards equity, diversity, and inclusion, also known as EDI, in regard to Americans' arts participation. However, recent social movements around racial injustice and police brutality, for example, the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter, have made these calls to action more potent. It is clear that the perpetual discrimination found within America's orchestral field is no longer sustainable in the 21st century.
Dr. Aaron Flagg, a member of the board of directors for the League of American Orchestras and jazz studies faculty at the Juilliard School, highlights the American orchestral field's, quote, persistent lack of ethnic and racial diversity, end quote, by outlining the, quote, underlying culture of privilege, exclusion, and unacknowledged bias that contributes to it, end quote. Founded in 1942 and later chartered by Congress in 1962, the League of American Orchestras includes, quote, more than 1,800 organizations, end quote, and serves as a lasting change initiative from Roosevelt's FMP era. Flag details the, quote, documented history of conscious exclusion, harassment, and discrimination that includes segregated unions, hostile groups of musicians, staff, and board leaders, and bifurcated access to gatekeepers and mentors, end quote. In 2014, a study conducted by the League showed that only, quote, 14.2% of orchestra musicians identified as non-white, end quote, which highlights the continued lack of, quote, racial slash ethnic and gender diversity in the orchestral field, end quote. In 2019, the League announced their strategic framework towards the immediate improvement of EDI among American orchestras. Also citing partnerships with existing EDI organizations, for example, the Center for Black Music Research, the Composer Diversity Database, the Composers' Equity Project, Music by Black Composers, Latin Orchestral Music, and the Composers' Equity Project, the League has helped build a collective initiative that could change the field of American orchestral music entirely. Like the cliffhanger to a thrilling literary novel, quote, we are at a global point of suspended animation, an unparalleled point in history during which our systems are breaking and sitting idle, end quote. COVID-19 will no doubt join the Spanish flu and the Black Death as a major event in human history. As the world continues to evolve in complexity, these episodes of complete vulnerability refocus attention towards overshadowed social instabilities and the essentiality of their resolve. However, this is not to say that pandemics are, quote, for the better, end quote. Rather, it is intended to highlight the unique opportunities for major social change and innovation. While it is clear that surges in arts production and innovation tend to follow periods of immense social strain or trauma, only time will tell whether orchestras, quote, retrench into what was or take the brave step that the Renaissance men and women took to envision a new future and then create it, end quote. Based on the cyclical nature of history, this comparative analysis of America's recent music history from the last 100 years or so presents useful insights into the overall trajectory of the orchestral field. Although Renaissance periods are typically labeled retroactively, the resemblances found between the 20th and 21st centuries of American music history strongly suggest that a new musical Renaissance period is upon us. Cultivating this ability to forecast periods of artistic innovation is important because it could help to streamline future funding towards musical projects and initiatives that effectively represent the key events in current music history. Over time, this would improve the quality of musical archives to include collections that are more inclusive and representative of the time period. Furthermore, the quality behind how history is recorded directly correlates to how useful such materials will be in future generations. Accurate historical references yield expedited innovation and growth by cautioning pitfalls and highlighting points of success, thus improving the potential and future for American orchestras. In closing, the League of American Orchestras voiced that, quote, the history of discrimination in America's classical music field, particularly in orchestras, is not discussed or studied or commonly known because it is painful, embarrassing, and contrary to how orchestras want to view themselves, end quote. However, ignorance is bliss. Simply being dissatisfied does not fix anything. In the wake of COVID-19, change has become non-negotiable moving forward, and for American orchestras, it is long overdue. In a time where, quote, the stakes are higher, in a time where, quote, the stakes are higher, acting now, demanding now, voting, pushing, proposing change will affect our big historical trajectory more than normal, end quote.
For this reason, now is the time for systemic change initiatives. Now is the time for a new orchestral renaissance. Thanks so much for tuning in. This has been the Imagine Podcast with your host, Dennis Rendleman. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.